Wasn't that the song they played on the Titanic right before it went down? I think that was the song with this nautical theme tonight. I was thinking of what Paul said in, in the book of Acts. He said, except you stay in the boat, you cannot be saved. Do you remember him saying that? So that's a good lesson. Stay in the boat. Well, praise the Lord that all is well. I'm sure he won't forget that experience. Okay, let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 26. Matthew chapter 26. And let's begin reading in verse 6. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he sat at meat. But when his disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, To what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this time that we have to open it together, to meditate upon it. And we ask that your Holy Spirit would help us all to apply it to our lives. Lord, teach us, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we looked at the account of the Jewish leaders, the religious and the political leaders. They were plotting together to murder the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we contrasted that to the, the priceless gift, that outpouring of Mary when she anointed uh, the Lord Jesus with that very precious ointment. And so... Matthew puts before his reader's eyes, on the one hand, pure evil plotting the murder of the Messiah, and then pure good and holiness and dedication with the story of Mary. Tonight we want to make another contrast, and I think Luke, uh, obvious, I mean Matthew, obviously intended this here, and we want to again contrast the priceless gift that Mary lashed to, lavished on the Lord to the attitude of the 12 apostles and then to the betrayal of Judas. So this is very appropriately placed in just the right place in Scripture. So in what we just read, we saw that Mary poured out a bottle of perfume on the Lord. And comparing this to the other Gospels, we know that she anointed his head and his feet. She poured the whole bottle over him from head to foot. And that ointment was valued at about a year's wage for a soldier. It was a very expensive bottle of perfume. And we read here that the other 12 apostles were observing what Mary did. They watched. You couldn't help, if you were in that house, you couldn't help but know what Mary did when she poured that ointment on the Lord, when she broke the whole bottle and poured it on him. It said the whole house was filled with the sweet odor of it. So they observed what Mary did, and they should have rejoiced in what Mary did. They should have been rejoicing in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ at that feast that night. And they should have understood that when it comes to demonstrating one's love and devotion for the Lord, nothing is too lavish. You can't be too dedicated to Christ. You, you can't love him too much. No sacrifice is too great for the Lord. And yet what we see here is Mary at a higher level of maturity than the 12 apostles. She realized something that the 11 apostles, Judas obviously didn't, but she realized what the other apostles did not realize about the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why the Lord wants this story to be told when the gospel is preached. And what was the response of the disciples? It said in verse 8, when the disciples saw it, they had indignation. Imagine them being indignant, angry, resentful. 
that Mary had demonstrated her love and dedication to Christ to such a degree that she poured out this very expensive bottle of perfume all over him? They were irritated with it. In Luke chapter 14, we're told the disciples said, why was this waste of the ointment made? And then it says, and they murmured against Mary. So here, the disciples, plural, were murmuring and complaining. They were indignant at the waste. That's how they viewed this offering that Mary made. Now, the term waste means something that is ruined, something that is lost or perished. And in their mind, she wasted this. She poured it on his head, and most of it just fell down his garments and dribbled onto the floor and on his feet. That was a waste in their minds. And notice in verse 10, when Jesus understood it, when he observed what was going on, the attitude of the disciples and what they were thinking and what they were saying to Mary, he said unto them, why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. So here we see the disciples were indignant against Mary. They were murmuring against Mary. And they said that her act of selfless sacrifice was a big waste. And Jesus noticed that Mary was troubled by that. And that word trouble means to be beaten down, to be struck. It was as if it was a gut punch to Mary that the disciples gave to her. It's a term that speaks of weeping and wailing and growing weary, a burden. And so Mary was deeply hurt by the attitude of the 12 apostles. She was grieved, she was hurt, she was weary from it. So evidently, it had been going on for some time, all this chitter-chatter in the room, in a time when it should have been excitement. Mary's brother, Lazarus, was raised from the dead by the Lord Jesus. Now he's there for supper. And if Simon was her father, he was at least a friend, she was invited to his house, and the Lord Jesus healed him of leprosy. She was doubly excited. And so that explains her actions there that night. And then, in all her enthusiasm and her love for the Lord, to get this gut punch from the disciples, she was troubled. And Jesus noticed it. Here was a godly woman demonstrating her love for the Lord. She was doing her best to honor him and to please him, to recognize who he was. And then along come her critics. And they were saying, that was a stupid thing to do, Mary. What a waste. You know, a little dab on his forehead and with the ointment would have been fine. That's the new custom. That's ordinary. Have you no common sense? Have you ever done your best for the Lord in serving God? Only to have folks complain about the way you did it. Didn't do it the right way. Or the choir was sour this morning when the choir was singing. Or at a church dinner, somebody's got to complain. These ladies are up in the kitchen, you know, uh, working themselves to death. And, and somebody's complaining, my peas were cold. People complain about the quality of the ministry. That was a lousy message. <laughs> there was one guy here years ago who, who used to rate my sermons. <laughs> I'm not kidding. He would walk out the door and he'd tell me, he'd give me a letter grade, you know, for the sermon that day. Okay. <laughs> Mary was criticized and it hurt. And they thought they had a much better way of doing it. Although maybe they never offered to help. Or have you been criticized by others for going overboard in your faith? As if there were such a thing. You know, some of your relatives might say to you, you know, I can see going to church on Sunday morning, but coming back at night, what's that all about? And then going to prayer meeting? Are you crazy? I think you're taking this religion a little bit too far. That's how people think. And it can be hurtful at times. 
I'm sure we've all felt it in one, at one point or another in our lives. Mary felt it that day, and she was troubled by it. And the grief that she felt was only intensified by the fact that her criticism was coming from the 12 apostles, no less. That made it worse. She might have expected criticism from maybe some of the unsaved guests at that feast that night, but not from the apostles. You know, criticism from believers hurts a lot more than it does criticism from unbelievers. Those living in the flesh will never understand the level of devotion and dedication that Mary demonstrated that night. They'll never understand the level of de dedication demonstrated by any spirit-filled believer. And it will be considered a waste. They'll think, what a waste of time. Over the top. When God's estimation is, it's a reasonable sacrifice, a reasonable service. And so if the Lord should lead you to pour out the rest of your life in missions... That's the only place you'll ever be happy. And don't listen to the naysayers who say, what a waste. He had so much prospect. He had so much going for him, and now he's going to waste it all going to the mission field. God honors this woman in this chapter, and we're going to see he rebukes sternly the critics, namely the apostles. And so the next time you get criticized for serving the Lord or being too religious, remember what this story is about. They said to Mary, to what purpose is this waste? This ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. So notice the, another contrast here. The disciples were basically asking Mary if she thought that pouring out a whole very, very expensive bottle of ointment all at once on Jesus, they were saying basically, was that really the best use of that ointment? Wouldn't it be a better use? Wouldn't it be a better purpose to oint, anoint him with oil? Maybe uh, put a lot of oil on his forehead, just make sure that he is uh, comfortable and, and encouraged by it. And then sell the rest and give it to the poor. That would have long-lasting effects, wouldn't it? People would be fed. Instead of just wasting that ointment, half of which fell on the floor. Now, the disciples weren't asking Mary or telling her that she should have used it for an evil purpose. The disciples didn't want that money to be used on themselves selfishly. They didn't want that money to be used carnally. But they just felt that this was a poor use of that money. It could have been sold and fed many people for a long time. Just a little dab on Jesus' forehead would have been sufficient. A better way of using that would be sell it and let's feed the poor. Now, what the disciples were saying was good. Is it good to feed the poor? Of course it's good to feed the poor. And on any other occasion, that might have been a very acceptable uh, use of that money. But Mary's thoughts were not just good. They were best. They were excellent. The disciples were focused on earthly things and, and the needs of men, which was good, but Mary was focused on the Lord Jesus Christ, which is far better. Mary was much more in tune with the Lord Jesus than his own disciples were. And Mary was aware of truth that went right over the heads of the disciples. You know, in recent chapters, we've been reading about the disciples and their attitude and their behavior just before uh, the Passover was coming. And what were they up to? They were arguing over who's going to get the best seed in the kingdom. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? That's what they were all concerned about. And in contrast, we see Mary sitting at the feet of Jesus. 
Mary is portrayed in these chapters in a much better light than even the disciples. She was more spiritually minded than the disciples were. And another point to notice in this account is, why did the disciples bring that up? Why did they say at that point, let's sell it to the poor, let's sell it and, and feed the poor? Where did they get this idea? Matthew verses eight, 26 verses 8 and 9 tell us that that's what the disciples were talking about. There was all that chatter in the room. That was a stupid thing that Mary did. She should have sold it and fed the poor. But turn to John chapter 12. John chapter 12. Here's one of those apparent contradictions in the Gospels again. In John chapter 12, in verse 4. Then saith one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? So Matthew tells us that all of the disciples said this. John tells us that it was only Judas that said this. One disciple. Now, this is obviously not a contradiction, but what John adds, this little additional piece of information is that this idea seems to have originated with Judas. He thought of that idea, and he put that idea, he put that little bug in the head of the other disciples. And it's not because he really felt strongly for the poor, it was because he, he was the treasurer, and he was about to betray the Lord Jesus. He wanted that money for himself. And now the money that he could have gotten was wasted in his mind. So he put that bug in the minds of the other disciples. And then all the other disciples started saying to themselves, yeah, that's a good idea. We should have sold that and been able to give money to the poor. What a good idea. One evil instigator can stir up a lot of trouble. And that's what Judas did. So both of these accounts, Matthew and John, are true. They just add slightly different uh, aspects of what was taking place. Judas said it, and then all the other disciples started talking about it. And so where did this influence come from? This idea to sell this perfume and give to the poor came from Judas, who couldn't have cared less about the poor. You know, Judas never would have, he knew, Judas wasn't a stupid man. He wasn't a foolish man. He knew that he would never be able to convince the disciples to use that money for evil purposes. And so he attempted to convince them to use it for something that's less than excellent, less than best. Not bad, just not the best. And he had ulterior motives. You know, there are lots of good things that we could do, lots of good ideas that people have that might be good in and of themselves. But the book of Philippians tells us that we need to be discerning as Christians. And I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and judgment or wisdom or discernment, that ye may approve the things that are what? Excellent. Don't settle for something that's okay. Shoot for that which is excellent, that which is best. The disciples were approving of something that was okay, it was good, but Mary had in mind something that was excellent. It was superior. It was the best use of that ointment. You know where the 11 disciples are today and Mary? They're with the Lord in heaven. And one day you and I are going to be with them and with the Lord. And when we get to heaven and we 
consider the life that we lived, we're going to realize that from heaven's vantage point, things are going to look an awful lot different than they do to us here today. Do you think, do you think that in heaven we'll sit and wish, I never wasted all that time going to prayer meeting. That was such a waste of time. I could have been in the, the bowling league. I could have improved my bowling skills. Or do you think that believers in heaven will sit there and talk about it on, to one another and say, you know, I wish I hadn't given so much money when we had that uh, missionary that was going out. I wish I hadn't given all that money that year. I could have gotten that 1988 Mustang that I had my eye on. Those are not the kind of thoughts that we're going to have in heaven. Heaven has a way of changing our perspective. And I really doubt if Mary is sitting in heaven now saying, you know something? I wish I never poured all that ointment out on the head of Jesus. We could have done so many things with that. The only regret that we'll have when we get to heaven, figuratively speaking, is if we left that alabaster box on the shelf. And nobody ever smelled the sweetness of it. Nobody was blessed by it. We just hoarded it and kept it all to ourselves. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Mary understood that. She understood that whatever we do for Christ, however whatever level of dedication we pour out onto him, it's never a waste. And then look at the words of rebuke and praise that we read from the mouth of the Lord Jesus, beginning in verse 10. When Jesus understood it, when he understood what was taking place between Mary and the disciples, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work upon me. For ye always have the poor with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she hath poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a, memo a memorial of her. Now we know what the disciples thought of it. They thought this was a big waste. That's what Judas thought of it too. But now we get to hear what Jesus thought of this. He was angry at the disciples for troubling Mary. Now, he didn't rebuke the disciples because they wanted to feed the poor, but he did rebuke the disciples for troubling Mary, for making her feel bad for her dedication to Christ. That was sinful. It caused her much distress and grief. What the disciples did was bad, but what Mary did was good. She hath wrought a good work upon me, Jesus said. And he praises Mary. He side, he's on Mary's side. There was an argument going back and forth, the dispute, they were murmuring against her, and Jesus sided clearly with Mary and against the disciples. And why was it good what Mary did? Because Mary demonstrated that she was spiritually aware of what was really taking place at that hour. Mary was conscious of the fact that the Lord's hour had finally come. Now, he had spoken about his hour, that time when he would, the Father's time for him to go to the cross. And he had mentioned it many times. He says, no, nope, my hour has not yet come. They couldn't, the Lord walked right through that crowd that wanted to kill him because it was not God's time yet. God's hour had not yet come. Mary understood that Passover was just two days away. His hour had come. And in verse 11, it says, For ye have the poor always with you. But Jesus said, But me, ye have not always. 
The disciples' attitude towards Mary was clearly wrong. What Mary did was the best. And why? Because Mary understood what Jesus said. There'll be plenty of occasions to, to minister to the poor. You'll always have poor people around. They've always been around. They'll always be around. There'll never be a lack of opportunity to minister to poor people. But I'm not going to be around much longer. Two days left. And Mary understood that. And Mary, in light of that, made the very best choice. She sacrificed the best that she had on the Lord. She appreciated what Christ did for her. He raised her brother Lazarus from the dead. She was so grateful. And either her father or her friend, this man Simon, at whose home she was, she, he, she was invited there for the feast. He was healed by the Lord Jesus. These people were excited. The Savior was there. And the disciples were thinking, what a waste. What a waste. In Luke chapter 10, it says, And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, this was another occasion, Martha, Martha, thou art careful, about many, careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. And this is how we see Mary when she's mentioned in the scriptures. Making good choices. And in each choice that was good, it was the best, she put Christ first. Now, the Lord wasn't rebuking Martha for doing something that was not good. She was making dinner for everybody. That was good. But Mary sat at Jesus' feet and listened to him. And that was the best. She put Jesus before everything else. And in this account, in Matthew 26, Mary was pouring ointment on Jesus. And as she did, she was aware of why she was doing it. Jesus just said, two days and I'm going to be crucified. It seemed to go right over the head of the disciples, but it hit Mary in the heart. She took the most expensive thing that she had, quite likely, and she lavished it on the Lord Jesus. Thank you for all that you've done for my brother and for Simon and for so many thousands of people in Israel. Thank you for being willing to go to the cross and die for our sins. What, what, what else could Mary do but give her best to the Lord? This was the last time she was going to see Jesus, she thought. And so she went, what others would call, she, was, she went overboard in lavishing upon him this expensive gift. But she understood that after all Jesus did for her and was about to do for her, he's worthy of that bottle of perfume and a 10,000 times more. She understood what the disciples didn't understand. And then it's not recorded in Matthew, but Mark, in this same account, the same story, Jesus makes an unusual statement there. He says about Mary, well, she did what she could. You know, when we say something like that, we usually mean, it's not much, but they did what they could. Like the woman that had two mites. She put her two mites in the offering. It wasn't much, but she did what she could. That's what Jesus said about Mary's offering. And that's a unique perspective. It's coming from the creator of the universe. It's coming from the Lord Jesus, who is God Almighty. However much we give to the Lord, however much sacrifice we give to the Lord... From God's perspective, it isn't much. We don't have much. We aren't much. We're made out of dirt. From the disciples' perspective, from man's perspective, 
Her extravagantly expensive gift was over the top. A waste. But from God's perspective, <laughs> one little bottle of perfume. I own the whole universe. That little bottle of perfume is nothing to the Lord. He doesn't need perfume. God doesn't measure our sacrifices by the market value of the gift. God measures our sacrifice by how sacrificial it was to the giver, how much it cost us. And the Lord saw in the gift of Mary something that was priceless, not the ointment, but her heart. The widow that threw in two mites, Jesus praised that widow. She did what she could. It wasn't much, but she did what she could. That's what she was able to give, and that's what she gave. And the same with Mary. It wasn't much, a year's wage for a soldier. God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He owns the universe. A bottle of perfume isn't much, but she did what she could. God expects that we do what we can for him. At the Bema seat, we're going to be judged for what we have done. And I suspect that we're also going to be judged for what we could have done, but didn't. So God had a very different view of her act than did the disciples. He saw it as extravagance, an extravagant expression of love and devotion and dedication to him. As an example of genuine love and devotion that he wanted men throughout the church age to be aware of and to hold in high esteem. You know how John ends his gospel? He tells us so many things happened in the life of the Lord Jesus that all the books in the world couldn't hold them all. So that means that what is recorded in the Bible is very selective. Of all the things that God could have put into the Bible, he was very selective in those events around the life of the Lord Jesus that he included. And he included this three times in Matthew, Mark, and John. The Lord wanted this story to be told wherever the gospel message, wherever these gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, wherever these gospels are taught, he wanted the story of this woman to be told as a memorial for her. So while the disciples might have criticized Mary and murmured against Mary, God had a very different view of this. God wanted this memorialized, not with a rock monument, but with a monument of words, a testimony that would live on all throughout the church age for 2,000 years now. And it should be an encouragement to us all, an example to follow. And then one other thing we see in this section, this story about Mary, was how discerning this woman was. Now look back in verse 12. <clears throat> Jesus said, For in that she poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my, my burial. Jesus states that this act of devotion and dedication to Christ, this anointing, was done for his burial. So this was not an ordinary anointing. It was common to wash the feet of a visitor with water. It was common to use maybe a little scented oil on the forehead. But it was uncommon to pour out a whole bottle of very expensive ointment all over his body. You know what the word Christ means? The anointed one. Mary recognized that he was about to die. The anointed one. The Messiah King that all the prophets in the Old Testament spoke about. She knew who he was. Even the kings of Israel were called Messiahs with a small M. They were anointed. 
Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed David, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. Now Christ comes on the scene, and he begins presenting himself as the Messiah King, the anointed one. In fact, that very week, he had introduced himself, presented himself on the triumphant entry into Jerusalem, presented himself before the nation as their Messiah, their Christ, their anointed one. And superficially, the people acknowledged him. But they didn't really believe on him. The same crowd would be chanting, let him be crucified, a few days later. But Mary believed. Mary recognized what the religious leaders in the first part of this chapter didn't understand. The chief priests and the elders of the people, they were plotting to put him to death. They didn't believe that he was really the Messiah. With all their theological training, with all of their so-called piety, they could not see in Jesus what this simple woman was able to see. And Mary also recognized she knew that Jesus was about to die. And she anointed him for his burial. So you might wonder, how did Mary know? that Jesus was about to die. The disciples didn't seem to know that, Mary, that Jesus was going to die. Well, there's one easy way that Mary knew. Jesus said it. He said it repeatedly. Now, she may not have been there, but she certainly was there on this account. And so notice in Matthew 16, it said, Jesus said that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised again on the third day, Matthew 16. Matthew 17, he said, the son of man shall be betrayed into the hands of men and they shall kill him and on the third day he, he shall be raised again. And the disciples were sad, oh no. In Matthew chapter 20, he said they shall condemn him to death and deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and scourge and crucify him, and on the third day he shall rise again. And now in Matthew chapter 26, look at verse 2. Jesus said it again on this occasion. You know that after two days is the feast of Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. I've been saying it over and over again, and I'm telling you now, the hour has come, just two more days, and it seemed to go right over the head of the disciples. But Mary believed. And the disciples were troubling Mary for being so extravagant on Jesus. A little anointment, ointment on the forehead would have been sufficient. And you know, even after his resurrection, many of the disciples struggled to believe that he rose from the dead even though he predicted when he was going to die and he predicted when he was going to be raised. In Mark 16, it says, and when they heard that he was alive and had seen, been seen of her, they believed not. In Luke 24, after his resurrection, he appeared to other disciples and he said, oh, fools and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets had spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered all these things? Didn't all the prophets predict his suffering and his death? And then even the unbelievers knew what he said. In Matthew chapter 27, the chief priests and the Pharisees said, we heard this deceiver say that after three days that he would rise from the dead. So even the unbelief, his words were not hard to understand. The apostles struggled to believe that Jesus really was going to die. They were so set on sitting in an important seat in the kingdom. They had been preaching the kingdom was at hand for three and a half years now, and that's all they could think about. And here Jesus was telling them, no, I'm going in to die. And they said, okay, but the kingdom is at hand. It's coming at any moment. They couldn't hear. They weren't really listening to what he said. The reason Mary was able to believe was she listened. She sat at his feet. 
she had some very deep conversations with the Lord. She knew that he was soon going to die and that she wasn't going to see him again, at least in this life. And after all that Jesus had done for her, and after knowing that as John the Baptist introduced him as the Lamb of God who will die for the sins of the world, including her sins, she was so grateful that no sacrifice could ever be too lavish or over the top. It was her reasonable service. She knew that the Passover was coming. She recognized he was the Passover lamb. He was the Christ, and she anointed him for his burial. She was more discerning than the, than the disciples. His death didn't fit in with their expectations of the coming of the kingdom in spite of the Olivet Discourse when the Lord Jesus said that kingdom is going to be postponed to a future generation. It went right over their heads. And while the apostles were busy preparing for greatness, Mary was quiet and listening. She sat at Jesus' feet and heard his words. She was a listener. And that's why she knew who he was. Because he said so. And she took him at his word. As simple as that. Simple childlike faith. She believed what he said. And Jesus was so impressed. He turned her story into a memorial of her devotion and her dedication and her discernment. Now, she wasn't a theologian. She wasn't a disciple. She wasn't part of the Sanhedrin. She wasn't part of the, uh, the priestly order. She was just a simple woman who had ears to hear. And Mary saw in Jesus a worth, a value, and a glory that the disciples didn't see. Jesus had been proclaiming for the last three and a half years that he was the king. He presented himself as the Messiah king. And Mary believed. They were to repent and get their hearts ready for the coming of the Messiah. Mary repented and got her heart ready for the coming of the Messiah. And she now believed that Jesus was the Savior. You know, for anybody that gets a real glimpse of who Jesus Christ is, he will be seen as something that is more valuable than gold and silver, more precious than life itself. And Mary understood this. No amount of devotion is over the top. Mary saw in Christ what the disciples were unable to see fully. Mary saw in him, she saw the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And she believed. And then we turn in this same chapter in verse 14. And then the other side of this sandwich. Remember we described this chapter as a sandwich. We have the evil chief priests plotting to murder the Lord. Then we have... Mary's love and devotion in the middle, and now the other piece of bread on the bottom of the sandwich, we see in verse 14, then one of the twelve called Judas Iscariot went out unto the chief priests and said unto them, what will you give me? And I will deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for 30 pieces of silver. And right in the middle, of the evil, murderous plans of the religious and political leaders, and then the betrayal, the stabbing in the back by Judas. In the middle of that, we have this glistening gem, Mary's devotion. On this background, like, like a jewel on a black velvet background. And it made what Mary do, did shine. Evil men seeking to murder him. Now Judas, they're looking for a way to put him to death. Now Judas 
is going out and he's going to provide them with that way. He's going to turn him in. He's going to betray the Savior. Boy, there are lots of different views of Jesus in the gospel, aren't there? Lots of different responses. The right response is to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and then give him your life. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time that we've had to open the word together to consider this wonderful story about Mary and her dedication to the Savior. Lord, help each one of us to have that kind of focus on Christ, to see his true worth and value, the value of eternal things and spiritual things. And Lord, we pray that that might be the focus of our lives. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.